What amazes you about God and God's creation? For me, it is the majestic artistry of God's handiwork of water, sky, land and sand, the waves of the lakes and oceans, the uncountable grains of sand, the sun and the moon freely suspended among the stars and the amazing stars themselves. There's nothing like a starry sky. Sometimes when we live in urban cities, we miss the amazing starry skies. What amazes you about God and God's creation? For me, it's the trees and the flowers and plants, the fact that you can plant small seeds in dirt and with sunshine and rain, a good gardener can reap an abundant harvest that can feed God's people. That's what wows me about God and God's creation. And what really wows me about God is that the same process God uses to reap that harvest in the field is the same process God uses to reap a harvest in our lives. With some small seeds planted in dirt, we are from dust. And with some sunshine and some rain, the good gardener can reap an abundant harvest that can feed and serve God's people. That's what amazes me about God. The Apostle Paul said it this way, for we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. I wonder what the Apostle Paul had on his mind when he said such eloquent and encouraging words. Well, I surmise that Paul knows the truth of this statement from firsthand experience. See, Paul, once a persecutor of followers of Christ, was indeed God's handiwork, knocked down and blinded on Damascus Road, arrested and imprisoned multiple times. Even this letter is believed to have been penned from prison, other hardships throughout his life as a follower of Christ, if we were to study Paul closely, I am confident that we would conclude that Paul was indeed God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for Paul to do. Hard times and tough seasons sometimes call for the encouragement of the people, and we've had some hard times and some tough seasons. We've had and are still in a pandemic that has led to loss of life like we never imagined. We now see the violence of war afar, not to mention the war on the streets across this nation. Racism is alive and sick. Human rights are under attack. The writer of Ecclesiastes, the third chapter, offers this perspective. For everything, there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die a time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, 
a time to throw away stones and, to, and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to seek and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to sow, a time to keep silent and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. As perplexing as it is, each of these things happen in life. We wish that only the good stuff in this list of Ecclesiastes 3 happens and that the bad did not happen and does not happen, but the reality is that it all happens. So the writer just concludes that there is a time and a season for the good and the bad. Let me take that a step further, and this I know for sure, that while God does not cause everything that happens to happen, God surely can use the good and the bad. It was in the letter to the Romans that Paul says, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love God and who have been called according to God's purpose. Christians usually like that scripture. It makes us feel good about some of the bad stuff that happens, that, that God can work it out for our good. Today's text is the same author, the same sentiment, a different letter. And in this letter to the church of Ephesus, the apostle Paul says that we are God's handiwork. Created, he says, and stop right there. And note first that we were created. The word created denotes intentionality. In other words, we are not a mistake. Look at your neighbor if you don't mind and say, you are not a mistake. Come on, share the good news on today. Somebody needs to hear that. Amen. You were created, Paul says. Take it a step further, I submit to you that the Creator is continuously, intentionally creating us on purpose. And I just have come to know in my 50 plus years of life that one of the primary tools that God uses to create us is life itself. All that stuff the writer of Ecclesiastes says there's a season for, maybe there's a season for it because God uses it as one of God's primary tools of creation. In other words, life can not only rock and roll us, it can also shape and form us into what God would have us to be. We are, after all, God's handiwork. We've been created on purpose by life itself. Don't take my word for it. Come here, Malachi. Tell the people how God does God's handiwork. Malachi says in chapter 3, verse 3, For God is like a refiner's fire and like washer's soap. God will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And God will purify the descendants of Levi and refine them like gold and silver until they present offerings to the Lord in righteousness. And it is said that in those days, in the refining process, the metal is heated up in the refiner's crucible. And while it is heating up, the refiner sits, sits close by, and will look into the crucible Nope, not ready. Let's heat it up a little bit more. And he'll sit there and, and while it's heating up, and then he'll look into the crucible. And he'll heat it up and look into the crucible until he sees his reflection in the metal. You missed it. You missed it. He will look until he sees his image. And then he says, it's been refined enough. Malachi says God is like the refiner and the refiner's fire. When life heats up on you, that might just be God. 
And it seems like God is just sitting there and watching you go through stuff. You might be correct that God is just sitting there like a refiner, Malachi says, for we are indeed God's handiwork. Created in Christ Jesus, Paul says, for good works. And my contention is that life is God's primary artistic tool. But don't take my word for it or Malachi's word for it. Hear the word that God spoke through the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah 18, starting with verse 2, says, Come down to the potter's house, and there I will let you hear my word. Jeremiah says, so I went down to the potter's house, and there he was working at his wheel. The vessel he was making of clay was spoiled in the potter's hands, and he says, and he reworked it into another vessel, as seemed good to him. Jeremiah says, then the word of the Lord came to me, can I not do with you? just as this potter has done? Just like the clay, God says to Jeremiah, in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand. And what wows me about God is that more than 2,000 plus years ago, God's prophets had an understanding that modern science now has that we are shaped by life and life's happenings and life circumstances that life shapes our psychology and even our physiology, that life shapes our intellects and our passions. Both prophets Malachi and Jeremiah had analogies from their days and times, the refiner's process of metal, the clay in the potter's hand, that throughout life as God's children, we are being shaped and refined. In some cases matured, prayerfully through this Christian life being healed. Surely throughout life, as the hymn said today, we are being changed. These prophets are talking to God's people, those who believed in the living God. And Paul, speaking to followers of Jesus Christ, says we are God's handiwork. Created intentionally by God, you're not a mistake, by life itself. That life at any given time is either heating up and refining us or molding and shaping us into what God would have us to be. Not just for any reason, but Paul says we are created in Christ Jesus for good works. In other words, we are created on purpose for a divine purpose. And God, in God's infinite wisdom, is not doing handiwork miraculous artistic refining and pottery work on us to be like Leonardo da Vinci's Mona Lisa or like these stained glass windows that are so beautiful just hanging there to be seen. I know some of us think we're a cute work of art <laughs> and for some people that's as far as their sense of purpose goes. How do I look? But we know that God created us, refined us, and shaped us, or Paul is teaching us, that it was done for a divine purpose. So that we will do, Paul says, good works. Paul says, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And this absolutely wows me. First, that like the moon and the stars and the lakes and the oceans, the flowers and the mountains and birds, fish, insects, butterflies, and the rest of all creation, we too are God's handiwork. See, we will be wowed when we see a beautiful bird so intricately, pa intricately painted, but we don't see the amazing creation that we are. Yesterday, Clara Takarabe came. Most of us have heard her play, 
her viola for us, and, and she's played. She has clinically designed improvisational music. And yesterday she taught about the brain and its levels of development and by what age certain parts are developed and what are not developed and how music touches a certain part of the brain and, and builds it for certain purposes in our lives. We are God's handiwork. God was intentional by this design. And Paul contends that upon our acceptance of Christ, God began doing even more handiwork on our lives, and God did it so that we could do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. The intentionality of God blows my mind. That God has done some work on me, and God has done some work on you, so that we together could do some good work, or as John Lewis says, get into some good trouble that God already has our name on. Maybe it would under, help to understand the good work that God has for us to do in Christ Jesus. In order to understand the good work in Christ Jesus, we need to understand the work of Christ Jesus. I always encourage new Christians and, and Christians who have not been in Bible study much to start by studying the one you say you follow. Study Jesus. Because if you only take what comes across the pulpit throughout your life, you might only be getting what that clergy person understands about Jesus. Study Jesus. Study his moves and the things that he said and the things he didn't say, the things he reacted to, the things he didn't react to, the things he spent his time doing and saying and teaching. Study Jesus. We have three years recorded of his life, but that's enough for you to study and come to an understanding of Jesus. In order to understand the work of Jesus, it would help to hear from Jesus himself. And so hear Jesus this morning. High Park Union should know this verse by heart. Pastor Sarah and I go to it often. And in Luke 4.18, he picks up the Isaiah scroll and he says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim the release of captives, recover the sight of the blind, to set those who are oppressed free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus is reading from the prophet Isaiah, and shortly after he reads it, he says, today this is fulfilled in your hearing. And we believe that to mean that this is why I came, this is what I will be doing, and as followers of Christ, here's our model. You might have missed it, but, but the prophet here gives another process. Hear him again. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me. So Malachi said God refines us, turns up the fire until, God, until he sees his image. Jeremiah says God molds us and shapes us. And Isaiah says the spirit anoints us. That's where the power comes from, to do what God has called us to do. Jesus affirms all of this in Luke 4 because he's coming right out of a time of testing. He was in the wilderness and the text says that the devil tempted him in every way and he was hungry and he was starving and he was suffering, but he stayed in that wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights and he emerged with purpose. I know that many of us grew up learning that the good work of Jesus was simply that he died for our sins so that we could have eternal life. Many of us equate that alone with the gospel, that he was born to die for your sins and mine. Hallelujah. But that's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, has anointed me to do good work. 
which God prepared in advance for me to do. That's what he said. It's that work that God prepared in advance for Jesus to do. It's the same work. We don't have to look far that we, too, are called to do. That is indeed the gospel. And just like Jesus, I tell you, we have been created on purpose for a divine purpose. I know life has rocked and rolled you, and if you're still alive, it's going to rock and roll you some more. Heated you up and refined you, but has also shaped you and formed you, prayerfully healed you, and I continue to pray for all of our healing because life can do a doozy on us. As Christians, God has a way of using life as a tool to shape us. Think about the things you're passionate about. Think about the things that you want to work on. Think about those causes that are important to you. I bet you could route those all the way back to a tool God may have used. Didn't necessarily cause it, but might have used it to shape your passions and your interests your curiosities, your righteous anger. I was at a conference this past week and there were, it was interfaith, multi-faith, and there was a Buddhist, a person from Buddhism who, who shared this statement. It's better to do your own duty imperfectly than to do someone else's duty perfectly. Let me say that again. It's better to do your own duty imperfectly. In other words, you may have a sense that there is something you are to be doing, but you don't feel quite prepared, so you aren't doing it. Instead, you're doing that thing you're good at. And he's saying that's not necessarily your duty. It might be someone else's duty. It's better to do, discover your own duty, your own calling, your own purpose imperfectly than to do someone else's perfectly. We have been created on purpose for divine purpose and we, we find that divine purpose in Jesus. And just like Jesus, somebody here has the divine purpose to give good news to the poor. Life has rocked and rolled you, shaped and formed you so that good news to the poor pours out of you. To you, I say, go preach the gospel, go speak to the poor, go work on behalf of the poor, for the poor need your good news. That just may be your good work, go and fulfill your divine purpose, and just like Jesus, someone's divine purpose is to proclaim the release of captives. There are millions of people, mostly black and brown men and women, incarcerated in jails and prisons across this land. The United States of America incarcerates more people than any other nation. Some people even call it the United States of incarceration. And to add insult to injury, Lately, mostly black and brown men and women incarcerated for selling that natural substance that grows out of the ground like leaves that now leads to more white wealth legally than people ever made from it illegally. That stirs somebody's righteous anger. Maybe your journey gives you a certain sensibility about those who are incarcerated. Maybe you've been shaped and formed for good purpose. Maybe that's your divine. Go and fulfill your divine purpose. The people need your voice on their behalf to set the captives free. Maybe that's not your calling. Maybe you're simply not sure of your divine purpose in life. Let me encourage you that there is a purpose. Theologian Frederick Bigner said it this way, the place God calls you to is the place where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. 
We are indeed God's handiwork. Catch that. Created on purpose. God knows what God is doing. To do good works, the very works that Jesus said he came to do. Get to know Jesus and you might get to know your purpose. I believe that as Christians, if we could just grab hold to that reality that God has uniquely refined us, shaped us, equipped us, prepared us, and anointed us in Christ Jesus to do good works, not that we may boast. You heard the text that Jane read. It says, not that we may boast, for we are saved by grace not by works, but that as followers of Christ, we are part of ushering in God's rule of love, peace, and justice on earth as it is in heaven. We'd see a better society begin to unfold if everyone who called themselves a Christian discovered their divine works for which God has prepared them to do. So as I prepare to close, there is a deep hunger, maybe even a hunger for purpose. Like some of us have never seen it triggers, I believe, the violence that we see all throughout the land. That there is a sense of no purpose. One of the panelists shared yesterday that the young man that was shot and killed at the bean, that his mother said that his dream in life was to make it to 21. That's what he wanted to, to do in life. It is our job to help young people understand that there is indeed a purpose for which they can live beyond 21. Help them to find their divine purpose and all that is going on, my hope does not waver. And the reason it does not waver is because we are God's handiwork. Created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. There are people God has equipped on which God has performed God's artistry and as majestic as the sky and the sea, as intricately designed as a butterfly and the giraffe. God was intentional, created you on purpose, for a purpose, good purpose, divine purpose. But the very first step is accepting this truth. It's wrapping our minds around being God's handiwork. God, do you have your hand on me? Is that what I feel when things get tight or when things get hot, when I get frustrated or when I have clarity? God, are you working on me? The next time you see that butterfly, that bird, that flower so intricately, beautifully designed, and you say, wow, look at what God has done. I want you to go home and I want you to look in the mirror. As a matter of fact, every time you look in the mirror, I want you to say, wow, God, I've been through some stuff. But I'm still here to tell about it. And I just believe you might just use all of that because you are an artist. Just like you painted that butterfly, you're painting me into your purpose that you assigned to me a long time ago. Look in the mirror and say, wow, God bless you.